why was that successful? Why does this non-existent but imaginary tree on Mars, this Mars tree, why does it work to disprove this claim? There's a very commonly used tool in philosophy called a counterexample. A counterexample is an example. It's a single example that goes counter or against a generalization and thereby disproves, if it succeeds, that generalization. A generalization or a general claim is just any claim about a bunch of stuff. All trees on campus are deciduous. I teach at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and right now it is the winter, and so in the winter, the trees lose their leaves. Here's a drawing of a tree. At the end there, I tried to draw in the bark. I don't know if that was the right decision. Anyway, it's a tree, and it has no leaves because it's the winter, and in the winter, some kinds of trees lose their leaves. Those trees are called deciduous. So let's say I made a generalization about all the trees on campus, that they are the kind of tree that loses its leaves. Is this true or not? What if you wanted to disprove this claim? If it's true, then you can't disprove it. If all of the trees really are deciduous, you can't disprove it. But if it's false, all that you would need to disprove this claim is one example, one tree. You'd have to find one tree that's not the kind of tree that loses its leaves. You know, like an evergreen tree that, that has needles instead of leaves, for example. You would need to find one example. If you walked around the campus and found one evergreen tree, that one right there, that would be enough to prove that this statement is false. And this tree would be a counterexample. It's a single example that goes counter or against the generalization and thereby proves it false. Notice something about this counterexample. It's a real tree. It's got to be a real tree for it to work. If someone makes this generalization about a specific group of trees, all the trees on campus, right? If someone makes that generalization, then the counterexample must be a real tree. That one. You've got to find a real tree in the real world and that tree will function as a counterexample and will prove that this generalization is false. But there are also times when you don't need a real tree or you don't need a real thing to serve as your counterexample. There are times in philosophy when we are attempting to prove some general statement, like a philosophical theory. We're attempting to prove that it's false and we can successfully do so by producing a counterexample that's not a real thing, that's imaginary, that we've imagined. And not only that, sometimes these imagined things can be impossible, not only not real things, but things that, that can't ever be. But still, those impossible things that we're imagining, the fact that we can imagine them means that the generalization is false and they, those things serve as successful counterexamples. Why? How can that happen? How does that work? And why is it that sometimes you need a real thing to be your counterexample and sometimes you need merely something that you can imagine even if it's impossible? Why is that? Well, I'm going to explain that right now. Here's another generalization. All trees, by definition, grow on or near the surface of the earth. All of the trees that exist in the universe I think, exist on or near the surface of the planet Earth. We're not going to be able to find a real example of a tree that's growing, you know, on another planet or deep in the Earth's core or something like that. We're not going to be able to find a tree like that because trees evolved here on the surface of this planet and that's the only place that they are as far as we know. But this statement, this generalization is still false. Because this generalization is about the definition of a tree. This is a claim about treehood. Whereas this, all the trees on campus are deciduous, this is not a claim about treehood, what it is to be a tree. This is just a claim about a bunch of trees, the trees on the campus of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. So how are we going to disprove this claim? Because this claim is false. It's not part of the definition of a tree that it grows on or near the surface of the Earth. Well, we can disprove this with a fictional, made-up example. Imagine that we built a rocket ship, and the rocket ship, there's the, the bottom of the rocket ship, I don't know. On the rocket ship, there was a seed, 
and we flew the rocket ship to Mars. And we landed there and we planted the seed and we, you know, shined a bunch of fancy technology lights at it and, and watered it and did a whole bunch of stuff. And that seed grew into a tree. Here's the question. Would that tree, which is not on or near the surface of the earth, would that tree be a tree? Yeah, sure, totally it would be a tree. So this generalization, this general statement is false. And we've proven that it's false with an imagined example. The imagined example of putting a seed on a rocket ship and planting it on Mars and whatever. This fictional tree functions successfully as a counterexample to this claim. Why did that work? Why was that successful? Why does this non-existent but imaginary tree on Mars, this Mars tree, why does it work to disprove this claim? The answer is that this claim is about our concept of a tree. A concept is a shared idea. Uh, it's best to think of it as the meaning of a word. The word tree is a word that English speakers all have and we use that word. And then there's other words in other languages for a tree. And actually everyone who can think about trees, whether they can do so and express it in English, or they can think about trees and express it in any other language, we all have the, sh the same shared idea, a concept, the idea of a tree. This is a claim about the idea. It's not a claim about any actual trees, whereas this is a claim about actual trees. Because this is a claim about actual trees, we need an actual tree to function as a counterexample, to disprove this claim, to prove that it's false. But because this claim is just about our idea, we just need to do a little experiment on our idea, on our shared idea, our concept of a tree. And the way that we do that experiment is by imagining the scenario. Is it coherent to imagine something growing with a trunk and leaves from a seed on another planet, elsewhere in the galaxy or our solar system or whatever? Is it coherent to imagine that and for that thing to be a tree? Does it, does it match up with our shared idea, our concept of a tree? The answer is yes, it does match up. And so, this, this example, this fictional example functions successfully as a counterexample to this claim, even though it's made up, because this claim is about an idea, a concept. And you can prove things about ideas with more ideas. You can't prove things about an actual tree unless, you know, you get an actual tree. That's why in some cases it works to have a fictional you know, example, but in other cases it doesn't. Imagine if someone made this claim, all the trees on campus are deciduous, they lose their leaves in the winter, they're that kind of tree. Imagine if they tried to disprove that claim by saying, no, I can imagine a tree that's planted right there, even though there's no actual tree there, I can imagine one being planted right there, and it doesn't lose its leaves in the winter. It's like a, an evergreen tree or a coniferous tree, that's a type of non-deciduous tree, coniferous. Uh, I don't care that you can imagine a tree like that because this is a claim about the actual group of trees, all the trees on campus. If we modify this claim and instead made it about the very idea of a tree on campus, we said all of the trees on campus by definition conceptually must be deciduous trees. If that was the claim, then sure, you could disprove it with a made up example, but because this is a claim about actual trees, you need an actual tree to serve as its counterexample. But this is a claim about the concept, the very concept of a tree. And so it works perfectly well to have a fictional example. How does all of this relate to philosophy? Well, when we do philosophy, we make all sorts of generalizations. Think about the kinds of theories that you will encounter in a college level philosophy course. We are morally required to produce the greatest total of pleasure minus pain. That's a theory in moral philosophy called utilitarianism. Mental states are brain states. That's a theory in the philosophy of mind called the mind-brain identity theory. These theories are just generalizations. And so you could disprove these generalizations with examples, with a single example, a counterexample. Now, it is most natural to interpret these claims as claims about concepts. The first is a claim about the concept of morality. And the second is a claim about the concept of the mind. If that's true, if these are claims about concepts, then we can disprove them with 
fantastical, fictional, made up, imaginary examples. We could imagine a scenario, even if one has never occurred, where there's an action that seems to us intuitively to be morally bad, a bad thing to do, but nonetheless, it produces the greatest total of pleasure minus pain. If we can think of an example like that, and if this claim, utilitarianism, is understood as a conceptual claim, well then, that example, although it's fictional, functions successfully as a counterexample to this theory. All we need is an imagined example, just like here, all we needed was an imagined example. That's what counterexamples are, and that's how they work in philosophy.